Hey, did you enjoy Garrett Anderson? Hey, I did too. Uh, did you know he has impacted our lives for a long time and may not know it? I mean, the great I am, he wrote that. And many of the songs that he, he sang for us today, he wrote those, and they have become a part of our lives. It is so neat to be able to actually see the guy who writes some of the songs we sing all the time and, and be able to hear him. Now, I will tell you, today is the first for me, all-time first for me in all my years. Never have I gotten up to speak after the 12 days of Christmas. <laughs> never, ever, ever. This is an all-time first. I guess you've probably heard that the, that the electricity went out on the Life Center across the freeway. And 23,000 customers lost their electricity. We were one of them on the other side. Yay, God, this side at least we had electricity on this side. Well, it's, we're almost halfway through December. Christmas is just like right around the corner. And you've heard of, of the three wise men. By the way, you don't, we don't really know there were three wise men. There were three gifts. We don't know how many wise men, but yeah, because three gifts, we always say three wise men. But I read somebody who wrote this. She said, well, what if the three wise men were really the three wise women? What if it was really the three wise women? Would the story have changed? And she said, I believe it would definitely have changed. First of all, they would have asked directions from the very beginning. <laughs> and they would have gotten here a lot faster. Could have been here maybe for the birth of Jesus instead of two years later. And if they got here for the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, they could have helped with the delivery. They could clean up the stable. They could have made a casserole. And she said the three gifts of the wise men, they were great gifts. Okay, gift number one was, you know the 12 days of Christmas, but you don't know the three gifts. The first gift was gold. The second gift was frankincense and myrrh. She said they're great gifts, and we, the th three wise women would have probably given them, but they would have also brought diapers. So practical. We're in the process of sort of getting our heart ready for Christmas. And it's more than just getting all the gifts together and having all the decorations. Really, to get ready for Christmas is to get us ready, get our hearts ready. And one of the things that we're doing to do that is going through a verse of Scripture that we always talk about every Christmas. You always hear it. Everybody's always, you know, you're hearing it or reading it many times. But what does it mean? I mean, what are the specific things talking about? And I, I found most people don't really know. It comes from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and, and it's, a, it's a verse that we hear all the time. But what we learned last week is, hey, this was written 700 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. This comes from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah never saw Jesus except in, in the prophecies that, that God had given to him. He wrote 700 years before Jesus, but he says more about the first coming and even, folks, the second coming of Christ than anybody else in the Old Testament. It's an amazing man that the Holy Spirit was able to use so powerfully. And Isaiah sees what nobody else seems to see. And the truth is, I don't even think Isaiah fully understood himself. And so last week we got started on this one verse and we learned some of the historical background of what was happening in, in history at that moment in which he writes because it has so much to do with what he is saying. And then we looked at that phrase, what does it mean that a child, unto you a child is born, unto you a son is given? What is he talking about in that phrase? And then there's four names of the Messiah he gives to us, and he shall be called. And he gives us four names, and we looked at one of the four. And today I want us to look at the last three. The last three are shockers. No wonder when he wrote this, he was probably just stunned. And anybody that read what he wrote had to have been stunned. So this morning, let's look at it. And the first one, well, before we look at it, let's go back to the verse. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto you is born 
unto you a child is born. Unto you a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. The hopes and dreams of a country will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So let's look at the last three. And the first of the last three is, and he shall be called the Mighty God. I mean, this was so stunning. You've got to step back for a moment and realize in, in, in Judaism, as he, he is a Jew and he's writing out of that and as he's thinking back and he, he's, he's writing, he must be thinking, I don't understand even what I'm writing, but I know that the Holy Spirit has given me this to write down. And so he faithfully wrote it down. This child that will be born will be called the mighty God. How is this possible? There's only one God. Sometimes we as Christians are accused of believing in three gods, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But those who accuse Christians of believing in three gods don't understand. We believe in one God, but one God who has shown himself in three different ways as the Father, as the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, where did this come from? Well, it comes from the New Testament, and even from the Old Testament in this this verse and some others, we have no choice because how the Bible describes Jesus is so clearly that Jesus is God who took on a body. Even Isaiah 700 years before is calling this Messiah who is coming the mighty God. And Isaiah must have just been startled at that. And those who read what Isaiah had written, I would think some of them would even be angry at him. How could you write such a thing? The mighty God. The word mighty in the Hebrew is a word that actually means hero. It means, it means warrior. It means someone who, who will stand for us, stand for you when no one else will stand for you. Someone who will fight for you when no one else would fight. He is the mighty one, the warrior. He's the hero that will stand for you and fight for you. Sort of like Moses in, in the Old Testament when he, he led the people of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. He stood for them and fought for them. Sort of like Joshua who took the people of Israel into the promised land. He stood with them and led them. Sort of like David when he defeats Goliath. But Isaiah is saying to us, there's a hero that is coming that is greater than Moses and greater than Joshua and greater than David. Because he's not just the mighty one, he is mighty God. The word in Hebrew that is translated God everywhere you see it in the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible, everywhere you see it, it's the word El, E-L. In many places in, in the Hebrew Bible, many places it is in plural form of all things. Elohim. Why is it that many times they would write God's name in the plural form? I don't even think they knew. But maybe it itself was a hint that one God would show himself in many ways. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In this verse, though, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, Isaiah specifically uses the singular form L, E-L, to say this one God, this one God will be in this child. This one God will be this child that is born. It's the most amazing statement that Isaiah makes. Now, Jesus is this one, this Messiah who came. And Jesus takes another one of the prophecies that Isaiah gives to us in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1, and he applies it to himself and listen to what it says. And the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort 
all who mourn. I want you to think, because this is what Jesus is saying about himself, I want you to think of Jesus as defending the poor, healing the blind, the lame, the sick, setting free those who are captives to their own sin, raising the dead. Could there be a greater hero? Is there anyone who would fight for you more? Is there anyone who would stand up for you more? He is the mighty God. But notice what else Isaiah says. Isaiah then says he is the the everlasting father. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. This is the strange becoming stranger. I remember as a younger pastor just coming across this verse and thinking, this is so odd. Why would Jesus be called the Everlasting Father? I mean, there's God the Father. He's God the Son. I mean, I don't understand this until... I spent some time and studied it, and I discovered that in the actual Hebrew, it is not translated everlasting father. It is translated the father of eternity. And suddenly the lights came on for me. What I say is saying is, i, I got to tell you, it'll blow your mind. What he is saying is, is that not only is this mighty God, he is the father of eternity, meaning he is the one who created time. He's the one that created the universe. He is the one that created everything. This child who is born is the one who made everything. I mean, seriously, Isaiah had to step back and say, what? And yet this is what the Holy Spirit was saying to him, and he faithfully wrote it down. I think there's some in this room who are saying, what? Jesus is the creator of everything? Listen to what the New Testament says about Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 3. Through Jesus, all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. Did you know that? And listen to what he says in in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Here is God. No one has seen him. And this God takes on flesh and blood, and now we see him. And notice what else it says. And he is the firstborn over all creation. One of the great problems about translating from one language to another and from one culture to another is that some things just simply don't translate. And this word is one of those, the firstborn. The firstborn in the Hebrew and then the, 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 the Jewish mind of the first century does not mean the person who is born first. The firstborn does not mean the the person who is born first necessarily. It actually is a word that means the preeminent one, the one who is over all. Because in the Old Testament, the Bible says in the Old Testament that God called Israel, Israel is my firstborn. No, no, wait a minute. Think about this. Israel didn't come for thousands of years after Adam and Eve. There were plenty of other cultures that had arisen. In fact, Israel came from Abraham, and Abraham actually came from a civilization called the Sumerians that were there in Iraq and Iran, and God called him and from Ur, who was in that region, and said, come, and he kept coming, and God said, I'll tell you when you get there that you're there, and he came all around to the, to the place that we now call the promised land. But it was thousands of years later. There were plenty of people that were first born before Israel. But God says, Israel is my firstborn, meaning it is the preeminent. It's my chosen ones. It is above all. So when we read in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, it doesn't mean created son. And in this passage, he's the firstborn of all creation. doesn't mean 
the first created doesn't mean that. The Bible never speaks in those terms. In fact, exactly the opposite. When you see that referring to Jesus, it's always talking about the preeminent one, the one who is above all. So notice what he says. He says, here is God who takes on flesh and blood. He is the preeminent over all creation. Why? For, verse 16, by Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, that's the preeminent, and in him all things hold together. This is how the Bible describes this child that was born, this son that was given. God is whispering into the heart of Isaiah, Isaiah, the Messiah that I am sending will be me. He will be the father of eternity, the originator of everything and the sustainer of all that he originated. It will be me. In the birth of Jesus, everlasting steps into time. Forever becomes temporal in a body. One who is infinite becomes an infant. He actually steps into your story, your difficulty, your pain, your questions, your needs. The Father of eternity wants to be your Father. Not distant, but near. Not separated, but with you. with your past and all you've gone through and all the struggles and whatever the scars are that you keep with you from your past, all your present, all of the future, what it is that's on the other side of the hill you can't see, that is coming towards you. You don't even know, but he knows. And he says to you and me, would you let me be your guide? I can help clean out the scars of your past. I can help you know what to do in the present. I can even guide you through the future because I'm the father of eternity and I will sustain you all the way to forever. Would you let me inside? For unto you a child is born, unto you a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Father of Eternity, the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace means the originator and the sustainer of peace. It's, it's more than just a good feeling inside. It's more than just a calmness. It is, it is a wholeness. It's a healing. And he says, I want to bring you to wholeness. I want to bring total healing inside you. I want to be your prince of peace. The prince of peace can bring peace between you and others. Is there someone you're struggling with, someone there's a bitterness? He says to you, I can actually give you the ability to forgive. I can actually give you the ability to restore that which is broken between you and whomever. I can be your Prince of Peace toward others in your life. 